Yes, please. Okay, welcome everybody. And I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Kiango. Uh, we recently became friends, let's say, uh, through these initiatives. And we meet very often now to discuss about the uh, initiatives and the uh, uh, concept of the regenerative urbanism and uh, also about the publication that we are planning to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, create as a result of this initiative. And she is an assistant professor of urban planning at, in UCLA, uh, Laskin School of Public Affairs. She researches the relationship between urban ecological design, spatial politics, and social uh, uh, mobilization in the context of climate change and global urbanization. And more broadly, her research interests include urban theory, urban design, environmental planning, and urban policy ecology. As a professional architect, she co-founded design firm, uh, super interesting, and has practiced with uh, Wes Manfredi and NBRDB. Sorry, NBRDB. She pre previously taught a. Uh, Northeastern University, MIT, University of Pennsylvania, the New School, and Washington University in St. Louis. She received a PhD in urban and environmental planning from MIT and a Master of Architecture from Yale University. And uh, there's a lots of sort of a publication listed and I, I think maybe I should skip it as I'm not sure if I can pronounce it right. But now this new book is on the way, right, from MIT Press. So we are very excited to have her in our seminar. So please welcome Kian. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Hitoshi, for the invitation. Thank you, Lena, for setting this all up. Uh, it's very good to meet you all. I've heard a little, just a little bit about your work since the start of the quarter through our meetings. And, you know, I think, I think it's abundantly clear that the topic you're working on is like really important right now. I think every year, so I've been in LA for not that long, four plus years. And every year, I think it becomes more and more urgent, it seems, that we deal with this particular issue around fires and urban design and architecture. Basically, how can we as designers envision new ways to deal with one way or the other these uh, rapidly emerging and worsening conditions? And, you know, to me, it's, it's a really interesting problem because, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this when, when, when I get into my work a bit, but like I study, uh, urban design and climate change, and oftentimes the politics around urban design and climate change. And I think that's certainly a part of the work that this studio is trying to engage. But at the same time, I think there are lots of issues here that go beyond climate per se, like climate change is making the conditions that we're all looking at worse, but there are so many, uh, sort of baked in systemic problems in how uh, cities and regions are planned and designed that in some ways like are to me are some of the, the, the really foundational issues of why fires are becoming um, so bad. So I'll end with maybe some thoughts on that at the end of the talk today. But, you know, when I was thinking about what would make sense to do for today, I think what I'll do first, based on our conversations with Hitoshi, I think one of the key things is I'd like to link uh, to situate planning as a field of study, planning and research in cities and climate together as a context for you all to be able to think about 
designing for a variety of different kinds of environmental uh, impacts in, in, in and around cities. So the first part of the, the talk would be framing around climate change in cities. So really when we zoom out a little bit, uh, where, where is the uh, prevailing discourse, the debates and conversations around climate change in cities? And then I will focus much more after that on my research specifically, uh, the research that actually will be written, will be published in much more detail in, in the book that Hitoshi mentioned, uh, that yeah, it's coming out, but like a year from now, books take forever. So it's coming, it's called Form and Flow, The Spatial Politics of Urban Resilience and Climate Justice and it will be published by MIT Press in September 2021. So I'm super excited about that, but it's also a year, um, almost a full year away. And so the research that I'm going to talk about is the one that's part of that book. It's not on fire. And so what I'd like to do is to talk about that, to really try to understand some of the, some of the dynamics around cities, design and climate change that some of which can be translated and gener generalized and translated for some of the conditions that you all are looking at and some will not. But I think getting uh, an understanding of some of these different um, strategies and conflicts I would say around the world may well be helpful for our discussion. And then at the end, I will focus on uh, a couple of key issues that I think are emerging that I that I've been very focused that I've been you know that's been keeping me up the last few months, um, and then talk about fire in really more brief ways. One thing I would love because uh, we don't you know like I haven't met many, almost all, you know, all, all of you here, this should be useful for you. And so one of the things that I would welcome is for anyone to like pipe in during the course of the talk and interrupt as you see fit. So I know that we may well have like a more um, deliberate Q&A session at the end, but I would just welcome y'all to just like pipe in and say like, and, and, and either ask for clarification or comments uh, if you have any during the course of the, the talk. Uh, any, any questions or uh, anything on your part, Lena or Hitoshi? No, I think you, you, you can, I think you can share the yes. screen if there is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you should see a screen titled Planning Urban Climate Change. So to just intro the whole thing, my, I, uh, I studied architecture back in the day. I practiced architecture for about 10 years before I became much more interested in researching the city, particularly the, the, um, the, the tensions between uh, environmental threats from climate change and other kinds of environmental threats and what cities think that they should do in response to these threats uh, and the conflicts that emerge uh, in, in and around the, the city strategies to take on climate. And I'll focus on some of these sites that you see here in a second. But let's maybe take a step back First, and what I'd like to do is to uh, synthesize, I would say, the debate around cities and climate change. So 
one of the things that that's uh, become clear for me, going from architecture to urban planning, is now the 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 need really in in a lot of my work right now to situate the work that I do within a broader social science uh, conversation. So social science research on cities and on climate change, and there's an incredibly long. Uh, history of research around cities per se. So what are the, just the dynamics, the specifics, the uh, the kinds of particular kind of urban, urban conditions that make us understand cities to be what they are. And then um, a little bit more recent, but certainly at this point, quite robust set of literature around climate change and how it impacts cities. So if I were to like zoom out, I would say there are like six different ways in which cities and climate change have been understood. And these are a little bit um, in chronological order, although not strictly, and they're also not not you not not exclusive. So a lot of this research actually spans some of these different um, distinctions. So one of the things, uh, one category would be, uh, what are the specific climate change impacts on and off cities? as centers of population, as centers of infrastructure, culture, and commerce. So the conversations and the research around this particular topic, they tend to focus on why cities should be seen as a particular kind of thing. So a city different from, you know, generally speaking, like the countryside or rural places, why they may exhibit particular geographies physicalities, demographics, or institutions of governance uh, that, that we need to understand to know how climate change would impact them and what we might be able to do about it. So that's one uh, bucket of research. Second, another uh, set of research would be around how cities plan to mitigate or adapt to climate change. And this, I would say, has been the, the set of core research and literature that people point to when they talk about um, uh, the, the research, like the social scientific research on, on cities and climate change. So research in the, investigate the ways in which city policies can help reduce the overall greenhouse gas emissions. In that case, mitigating the causes of climate change or the way cities can be modified, redesigned, changed in, in one way or other in response to climate impacts, uh, therefore ad adapting to climate change. And if you talk to many folks in the climate change research world, they will be quite rigid and, and, and rigorous about making this distinction between mitigation and adaptation. And for a long time, researchers in and around climate change were somewhat skeptical about the um, ideas to adapt to, to it. Because in a, in a way, they felt that if we, if, we, if, we, if we keep talking about adapting to climate change, we're essentially ceding the responsibility or letting go or you know, giving up on ways to mitigate the causes of climate change, which we know we have to do. There's no way we're going to keep on adapting to a kind of like runaway climate. So, um, there, we, I, I, and I agree with this sense that we need to actually be quite precise about what we think we should be doing, mitigating, adapting, or as I think most of us now agree, both in some ways together. A third might be um, about how cities become resilient. So this idea of resiliency has become really popular in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, generally speaking, it's understood to be how cities bounce back from shocks and stresses. Uh, so, and you know, why wouldn't that be good? Generally, I would agree that we want uh, 
places, institutions, groups of people to be able to recover from any kinds of adverse impacts that they face. Uh, but there's been an emerging set of conversations that are quite critical about the notion of resilience, mainly questioning about why it's desirable to quote, bounce back to conditions that you know, basically led to the kinds of problems that we see in cities right now. And uh, a lot of us, and I would be part of this group, we think that the resilience debate sometimes enables us to ignore some of the inequities in why climate change impacts are quite uh, disparate. So poor and marginalized people tend to be impacted most and um, uh, by climate. And this idea of bouncing back sometimes just accepts that that is the case. Four, and we're going a little bit, I think, more complex now. So uh, researchers who are really thinking about uh, how in this case, how the historical and ongoing processes of marginalization and inequality in cities uh, are exacerbated by climate change and also responses to climate change. So researchers in this realm would look at how systemic in inequities in cities, um, basically poor working class communities of color have already suffered in uh, because of urban policies and will suffer still from both the, the, the impacts of climate change and oftentimes actions that are meant to protect cities from climate change. So there are cascading and uh, nested uh, threats to people who are already marginalized and we need, really need to, to, to uh, to be concerned about that. Five, this is a fifth bucket of, of, of discourse and literature. Uh, how are processes of urban change intertwined with processes of environmental change, particularly in the context of climate change? Change comes up many times here, but it's really how the particular agents and institutions of urban governance how they are shifting uh, in response to climate change to either protect, maintain, or consolidate economic power or territorial control. So how do, can we understand the different ways that cities are being governed because of, uh, of imminent climate change and for many political and economic elites, the imperative to protect their source of wealth, their source of power. And then finally, how are cities part of broader scales and levels of environmental change? So here uh, we're questioning how, whether, whether the city can be considered um, as its own object of analysis by itself. And this reflects some conversations in urban theory about the fact that oftentimes when you call something a city, uh, it's really quite messy. We, we generally talk about the municipal boundaries when we, when, when we say city, but that's not always the case. We often mean when we say city, the urban region or the ways in which different political conditions or economic uh, ties or social relationships actually transcend any kind of distinct municipal boundary. So this uh, set of research looks at how when we talk about climate change, we actually need to look beyond the city at the intertwined and interconnected ways in which uh, processes in the city are linked to far larger and smaller urban processes. So these are, in my view, six different ways you can parse out various kinds of research and debates 
about the relationship of cities and climate change. Um, if you ask another scholar, they would probably come up with a different set, but there are a lot of clear overlaps. And broadly speaking, I think my colleagues, especially those who look at, at, at cities and climate change with a more critical lens would agree with many of the distinctions that, that I've made here. Uh, if you're interested in actually like probing more into some of the literature here, the citations here. So these are all in a paper that I, that I wrote called Urbanizing Climate Justice that was published earlier this year in the, Cam the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy and Society. So that article traces out uh, these six uh, buckets or, or six categories of, of debates and then offer some other ideas about, about these topics. I'll pause a little bit just to, well, to catch my breath actually, and maybe like let things settle. Um, so out of these different ways to think about cities and climate change, to me, two of the issues arise in a way that, that, that needs further investigation. So one of them is about scales, uh, scales, the scale of practice, scales of research and thinking, and scales of planning and design. So where do we think uh, some of these processes start and stop, and how do we um, how do we retune our ways of thinking or practice to impact them in the ways that we want? And the second issue would be about justice. So I think increasingly, as researchers around urban climate change have have been have been expanding and and their their uh, their their views about this. Uh, we've increasingly put our finger on the fact that issues of justice really are front and center, not just in the ways where uh, people often say, oh, climate change, you know, will, uh, will hurt uh, people who are least responsible for it. So uh, poor, uh, poor people in the global south, mainly, who are least responsible for climate change will be the ones who are impacted most. Yes, that is certainly the case. And the fact that so many of our climate related projects are advertently or inadvertently harming further marginalized populations. Um, so one example would be things like creating uh, protected enclaves that are uh, designed and built to withstand projected climate impacts, but often have the, uh, the, the, the consequence of both keeping out people who may not be able to afford or otherwise access those kinds of on protected enclaves. Uh, and as well, the, the, the development and the building of the enclave uh, adversely impacting communities and places around it. So things like Eco Atlantic in Lagos, for instance, or the Jakarta, uh, uh, Jakarta giant seawall project that I'll be talking about in a few minutes, may well protect their inhabitants from climate change, but uh, will likely adversely impact communities around these projects. So these are the two issues that I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, because I think they're really they're really quite um, like pivotal right now. So I'll spend some minutes now talking specifically about the research I've been doing. So this is at this point you know a seven year long project. I started it early on uh, during my PhD. And it's continued and hopefully there, there will be some conclusion of it in, when the book comes out. But the, the topics are things that I continue to look at. Uh, so in my research, I've looked at uh, sites and design strategies 
in and around three cities, New York, Jakarta, and Rotterdam, looking at the politics around the urban design and infrastructural projects uh, in and around these sites, but also the flows of ideas and influence among them. So how, and, and as well, I try to look at this in a way where um, the interconnectedness actually changes how we see things on the ground. So the fact that we understand the, the relationship between one site and the other could make us think differently about what's going on in each site and what we should do about it. So in New York, for instance, so on the one hand, after Hurricane Sandy in 2012, which really was like a big wake up call for the city. One of the first major disasters that made people in New York realize that climate change fuel disasters could actually reach that far up the, the, the Northeast seaboard. Um, so after Sandy, initiatives such as Rebuild by Design, a uh, pretty high profile, urban, high profile design competition to come up with uh, strategies for, for more resilient places in and around the Sandy affected region, oftentimes exemplified by this project, the Big U by the team led by Big. And on the other hand, a lot of interesting on the ground, oftentimes grassroots initiatives such as Occupy Sandy and other groups that responded to the impacts of Sandy in quite interesting ways where one might find uh, examples of you know, community-based uh, responses to both environmental and, and social threats. So these different realms of responses after Sandy. In Jakarta, I looked at primarily, so Jakarta floods uh, chronically every year, Jakarta floods every year, every seven years or so, there'll be a major flood where about a third of the city is underwater. And there have been numerous attempts over the last decades to, to deal with this kind of flooding. Uh, in, when, when I got to Jakarta, it was 2013, uh, just after a huge flood. And I got to see a lot of the, the emerging conversations among city managers, uh, politicians, consultants, and some folks on the ground around what they thought should be done. Um, one of the most eye-opening responses to flooding was this uh, plan called the Jakarta NCICD Master Plan. So the National Capital Integrated Coastal Development Project, which is colloquially called the Giant Seawall. That's in, in a sense what it is. And also known as the Great Garuda, uh, the Garuda referring to this mythical eagle that is the, the symbol of, a Javanese symbol that's the symbol of Indonesia. Uh, so this plan for a giant seawall uh, was funded by, the master plan was funded by Dutch consultants. It was mainly designed by Dutch hydrologists and, and landscape architects and urban designers. And it called for essentially a brand new city to be built on landfill in the Jakarta Bay that both stopped the water coming in, so stopped rising seas from coming in, but also created these uh, massive retention ponds. You see them behind the shape of the wings. These huge retention ponds that could be pumped lower and lower so that the canals and rivers from the city could drain into it. So this was a large scale design and hydrological project um, that really sort of in some ways like tested the, the, the limits of, of how we consider uh, large scale urban hydrological management. And 
I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. And so, so on the one hand, you have these kinds of large scale master plans. On the other, you see that, you know, the folks who are impacted most from the flooding are often residents of informal kampong settlements, kampong translated as essentially villages or urban villages. These kampong residents who are most often hit and impacted by the floods because they generally live in uh, low-lying river, river in areas or coastal areas uh, and are at risk from increasing, from some emerging projects to deal with the flooding. And in some of these, in, in some of these kampongs, what you see are uh, some grassroots initiatives to actually consider new ways to design in response to floods. And I trace these uh, different sites and strategies back to the Netherlands where, uh, so, so the Netherlands uh, is well known for, for urban planning, spatial planning, and water management. And in increasingly, they've been positioning themselves as a kind of model for climate change adaptation, climate change responses. Uh, so tracing the, the actors and the strategies in places like New York and Jakarta to ideas such as like floating pav pavilions in Rotterdam on the left and a growing movement among Dutch uh, public and public private agencies to, to network and export in many ways the ideas that, that, they, that they consider to be homegrown uh, these Dutch ideas of spatial planning and water management. So it, it was interesting to me because I actually didn't think that I would be studying uh, the Netherlands. Actually, I'm going to pause on that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. So the one thing we do see quite quickly is that while these seem like disparate cities, taking on particular environmental and social challenges in and around uh, the urban regions, that they're interconnected in more ways than we might imagine. So they're interconnected through agencies that and consultants that, that one finds in each of these different sites. They're connected through governmental uh, agreements. So memorandum of understanding, uh, memoranda, memoranda of understanding in plural, between national governments that uh, for cooperation around these kinds of urban environmental issues and uh, connected by urban designers practices and ideas about their practices. So it's not that necessarily that the same urban designers might find themselves from one place to the other, although they, they, they often do, but that the ideas broached by specific urban designers tend to have a lot of mileage in and around different sites uh, um, in the world. And in each of these sites, you also see a kind of like ground up contestation. So on the ground uh, responses and, and protests uh, against some of these large scale plans pr proposed for the, for, for the cities. So in my work, you know, looking at this uh, sort of shifting and interconnected space, my, my research, I asked this one research question that really like motivates the whole, the whole project. In the face of climate change and uneven social and spatial urban development, how are contesting visions of urban futures produced and how do they attain power? So I'm interested in the ways in which our ideas of the future of cities are actually produced. 
and how they attain power, how they are legitimized uh, uh, to, to, to become the kinds of things that we think should happen in cities. I'll quickly, because this can be a little bit dry, sort of contextualize some of my ideas around this. Uh, it's the kind of thing that where if you are like an urban planning or an urban theorist, you might be uh, excited by. If you are not, you might be like, why am I looking at more citations? But the context that I look at uh, is basically this. this the, emerging discourse around climate change and, and urban adaptation, where increasingly cities think that they need to do things to adapt to climate change impacts that we can no longer really stop. Uh, and this notion of adapting has taken root in global institutions of climate governance, such as the IPCC, and increasingly into all kinds of aid and development agency work as well, such as USAID, the World Bank, uh, and such. Second, there's a, an idea about urban ecological security where cities around the world are positioning themselves as the kinds of um, best actors and places to address climate change threats. So, and, and uh, Hodgson and Marvin talk about this. They talk about how uh, cities actually want to be known as the, the sites in which some of these climate, um, climate change responses are taking shape. And what tends to happen is because they're protecting their centers of power such as in New York, the Wall Street area, it causes unevenness and, and ecological enclaves. And then thirdly, this idea of policy mobilities or worlding, which is that um, that that discussions about what cities can do are increasingly mobile and uh, crossing scales and levels so that you find cities looking at what models there are from other places and how these models can be translated back to different other sites. So, and that this, this what's called this interreferencing of urban models gives some cities a kind of privilege in how their ideas or their actions are perceived in the global climate change response world. So I, um, should I talk about this? Okay, just briefly speaking, uh, the, I, I, I think about this because I think that urban adaptation, so climate change adaptation scholarship has actually tended to miss a lot of uh, what's really going on. So it's, uh, it often, reinforces divisions between social uh, and spatial. So both social and spatial impacts and therefore social and spatial actions in response to climate change. It's considered urban politics to be contained and cohesive. So often you read a paper about Manila uh, and what Manila is doing about climate change. And it never talks about how Manila is one city contained in a, in a fairly sprawling urban region, and that ideas uh, that are being, being, being invoked in Manila are connected to broader, uh, broader flows of ideas and capital. Uh, and similarly, we conceptualize the city as a bounded territory and relevant for all of us here. Uh, a lot of the social science literature actually neglects the multi multifaceted role of design. M much urban climate change uh, discourse just does not think about the way that designers are part of making these ideas and have been part of producing ideas about the desired future of cities. All right, I'm gonna skip this one. That's, that's quite enough about uh, 
about theory at the moment, but happy to go back to some of this later. I'll talk about three points that I think are particularly salient from this research. Uh, one, which I call the nature of contestation, it looks at how this, this idea looks at how climate and environmental problems in cities right now in places like New York and Jakarta are very much informed by the social and political histories of their pasts. So, and it's based on, the, and, and so if you look for instance um, on, on the left at New York, so while the Rebuild by Design initiative was meant to reflect things like Dutch spatial planning, so very much um, national and regional based, so large scale um, comprehensive planning and protection. Ultimately, what happened is that the design projects themselves were fragmented for different localities and cities. So neighborhoods uh, or, or like, well, neighborhoods such as Hunts Point in the Bronx or uh, Lower Manhattan or particular cities such as Hoboken and certainly did not uh, did not reflect any kind of regional comprehensive ambition. So yes, there was an ambition to be regional, but because of the ways in which US urban planning and, uh, and planning project procurement is done, that, that regional ambition just could not be undertaken. In Jakarta, Again, we have this super ambitious design proposal for this great Garuda that, that spans the bay and it's meant to you know, ideally protect all the people of Jakarta. But the way that this project was conceived was very much tied to the political and economic situation in Jakarta. So the, the plan was that the Jakarta or Indonesian government, either city or national government would not have to pay any kind of public funds for this uh, ambitious mega project, but that the project would be funded through the sale of new land that was going to be available through the reclamation uh, that, that built the project itself. So you would sell, should the project have moved forward in this manner, they, they would sell the rights for developers to build on that land that yet to exist land in return for the funds to develop the flood protection infrastructure. So tying climate change and, and environmental change responses to really what has been the prevailing way that any kind of urban development gets done in Jakarta, which is relying on uh, large, large, oftentimes private investment to, to make things happen. And then on the flip side in New York, you have places such as Red Hook uh, in Brooklyn, uh, home to one of the largest NYCHA public housing projects. So already home to uh, poor communities of color, having to, 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 to keep on dealing with the impacts of Sandy years after the storm. So these uh, temporary boilers that were installed after the hurricane hit were there up till I think earlier this year. So a good eight, almost eight years before anything was done to them, essentially almost like a permanent, uh, uh, permanent case of temporary boilers. And then going back to Jakarta, um, these residents in Kampong settlements who are by and large considered, you know, outside of society uh, in settlements that are often, oftentimes considered illegal and always on the verge of being uh, evicted and demolished. The, the, the Kampong residents are, 
are then further at risk um, by both the impacts of, of um, both the flooding and as well the plans to respond to the flooding. So one of the things that was happening in Jakarta alongside the development of this, this large scale master plan is for uh, the kampongs al along the rivers to be evicted and the residents to be moved to new housing, often about 30 kilometers from where they used to be. So really disrupting the kinds of social and economic networks that, uh, the, the, that these uh, urban residents have been part, on, part of for decades. <laughs> So to, to, to assert that again, so while some of these ideas about climate responses might be new, they tend to be uh, always conditioned by the historical, political, economic processes in the cities themselves. The, the, the idea may be for innovation, but there's a lot of sort of like a inherited reactionary uh, things going on in the plans. So second, uh, the second key concept emerging from this is about the nature of flows. So I talked a little bit about um, how all these sites were intertwined. And, you know, one thing that made it clear to me was that whenever, you know, I would be I would be doing field work in Jakarta or in New York, um, and I would be talking to someone about what they were doing in response to flooding threats or climate or climate threats. And they would keep talking about, oh, you should talk to that Dutch guy. And it was always like that Dutch guy, right? Go, go talk to the Dutch guy. And it became really clear that Dutch uh, public and private agencies and individuals were very much part of these kinds of projects. And I saw that in Jakarta and in New York, my colleagues looking at other sites in the world noticed the same thing, that projects in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, were also very much reflected the same kinds of structures and individuals and agencies uh, as well in New Orleans. So the, these cities, although seemingly so unique, they seem to be so dramatically in, in, interconnected. Here you see Melanie Schultz, who was at that time the Minister for, uh, Minister for Environment and Infrastructure for the Dutch national government in Jakarta, signing the, the, the agreement for the NCICD master plan. And then on the right, again, Melanie Schultz here signing with uh, the, the previous HUD Secretary Sean Donovan had the Housing and Urban Development Department, uh, the US Housing and Urban Development Department, signing an agreement for cooperation between the US and the Netherlands on, on water management and urban sustainability issues. So from the top, these national uh, agreements for cooperation between these uh, these countries and cities. And so, of course, why wouldn't we look to, to the Dutch, right? So on the, we, we know, for instance, that uh, they, they have, they've had a long, they've had a long track record of, of water management success, mostly success. So Dutch spatial planning since around 800 years ago have come up with ways to collectively think about water management from the earliest water boards. So how to drain, uh, uh, drain waterlogged peat, peat bog areas in order to create room for agriculture. And then since the 1954 flood coming up with very large scale physical infrastructure such as the Delta Works in order to protect the most populous areas in the Netherlands. So you see on the left, uh, it's Rotterdam on the top there, the, the just slightly in, inland from the coast. And this, 
large scale infrastructure has remained part of the Dutch water management <laughs> landscape with uh, the, the, the 10,000 10, year storm protection, so incredibly high level of protections. But at the same time, we also see that the Netherlands is shifting their own attitudes towards water management. So on the right, I, uh, new concepts such as room for the river, which basically uh, proposes that not all dikes, so protections, water protections, either from the river or from the, from, from the coast, need to be in, to be maintained at the same levels, especially since climate change is making it more and more difficult to predict uh, how how much rain they get, how much actual storm surge they might they might have to face. So room for the river saying, actually, why don't we we let it up a little bit and design areas for flooding, for intermittent flooding, so that we don't have to keep raising dikes and dams to do this. So the so the Dutch spatial planners, in response to climate change have been shifting their own ways of thinking. Uh, and alongside, they've been also trying to make the point that uh, cities themselves need to take up some of these uh, environmental response tasks. So even though the, uh, the, the reputation of the Dutch and water management lies in these large scale protections such as the Delta Works, what they've been pushing as new ideas to deal with climate change and water in cities are projects such as on the left, this water square in Rotterdam, which is meant to be simultaneously a, a recreation and, and hangout space within a, a housing project uh, and as well environmental infrastructure able to accommodate floods from cloud bursts so that they don't have to make sure that their uh, flood protection such as the big dams and the, the pumps that are meant to keep water within their cities at a certain level that they do not have to be strengthened to take into account uncertain futures because of climate change and that they don't have to be done always on a regional or national level, that there can be certain design, urban design projects that can pick up some of the threats on a much more local level. And they've been pushing these ideas in events such as the Cities in Times of Climate Change conference in Rotterdam, where uh, among you know, different politicians and, and professionals from all over the world, you have major Dutch infrastructural and water management companies telling them about their their, uh, their, their expertise. So both focusing in on cities as the, the place to take on some of these threats and looking out at the world as new sites for the export of some of these Dutch ideas. And this is in response both to climate change and the uncertainty of climate change and new economic reasons to expand, uh, well, not to, 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 to not only do things on the national level, uh, but to have cities take up some of the responsibility, but also to expand outwards around the world. So many architects I talked to said things like, yeah, you know, there's not that much work anymore in the Netherlands. Uh, we've done a lot and uh, the economy is sort of, you know, stagnant, uh, but there are places such as Jakarta, such as the US and other places that 
are new grounds, literally new grounds for some of our ideas to be implemented. And in both New York and Jakarta, it doesn't take that much work to notice how much uh, uh, influence and participation uh, Dutch infrastructural, uh, well, Dutch engineers, urban designers, landscape architects, and economic development consultants are involved. So, what I learned from this, this, this idea of flows is that we cannot see the relationship between cities and nation states in a kind of static way. That when you look at the, the ways in which uh, influence and agreements and, and, and funding, oftentimes funding from master plans and things like this are disseminated, it's actually a much more complicated and multi-level, multi-scalar reality. So you have public-private partnerships, Dutch-funded research units, global urban networks, these transnational municipal networks, such as C40s, C40 or 100 Resilient Cities or Connecting Delta Cities, really squeezing in and making other levels of connections that enable things like quite local urban design projects like these water squares to be elevated as an idea that can be then exported to a variety of different places. And then, so third, the third uh, key concept coming out of this research is about essentially design. So looking at what was happening, I was thinking about how design itself was continually invoked to, to make claims about a project and to try to legitimize it and, and position it as the right project for the city and the, and the environmental threat that was being faced. So in New York, one of the, the, the interesting things about Rebuild by Design is that they, they enforced a pretty high level of community engagement, much more than many other examples of design competitions. The, the, the coordinators of Rebuild by, by Design basically told each of the design teams, you need to get constituent stakeholder support for us to, to award you the, for, to win, to win this award and for us to give you the money to, to implement it. So design teams actually went out and uh, explain design, explain their work, try to convince people like on the left here, Damaris Reyes, who is making, who's, who, who has the clicker in this photo, who is a community organizer in the Lower East Side in Manhattan, why they should support the big teams, big U project. So here's one interesting example where community engagement and design was actually required in order for a, a project team to, to win the award. In Jakarta, the, the, uh, the design was, you know, like such a major part of the proposal. You know, you cannot ignore this kind of uh, eagle Garuda shape that's rendered as this kind of white new white city that stopped the water from coming into the old city behind it. And when I talked to Heis van den Bomen, who is the landscape architect and urban designer at Kuiper Companions, the, the firm responsible for the, for the 
excuse me, for the design, he shows me this sketch where that he um, apparently did in a hotel room, kind of like freehand, you know, destroying the wall and the furniture, doing this, uh, this kind of, uh, this almost like single-handed vision of what Jakarta could be and trying to position it as something that really belongs to the people of Indonesia. So invoking the Garuda as a national symbol um, as a way to make something that would otherwise seem like a very, you know, a, a Dutch development project into something that could be perceived as a kind of Indonesian project. And I th to, to me, this was a, in some ways an interesting shift from often what is, what is brought up as critiques of large scale design. So like the critique of Brasilia, which is also shaped like, a, like an eagle, like these modernist design visions as disconnected from, uh, from the local, from local culture and community. The Garuda was actually in a maybe somewhat crass way, a very, you know, like, um, surface level visual way, really attempting to connect to a manner of culture. So it's designers recognizing that maybe the visions of the past need to be shifted somewhat to when, when we're practicing in different places around the world. But of course, you know, that doesn't always work. So simply the form of a Garuda is not enough to convince folks in Jakarta, especially folks who would be either displaced because of this project or who, who are maybe part of fisher, fishermen communities whose places of work would be destroyed because of this large scale, large scale infrastructural and, and urban development project. They weren't convinced that that this was you know any way more Indonesian than any other kind of project, and a lot of the protests against the giant seawall project was precisely about that. That look, these consultants, these designers don't even know what the problem is. They don't know our uh, local communities. They don't understand what we want to see in the world, and simply a kind of like um, vision of culture that you see here in the Garuda is not enough to, to make that case. And in response, what I thought was actually really interesting in the, in the Jakarta case is that you saw groups of community organizers uh, among the Kampung residents working with community architects to come up with different design ideas about what they want to see in their in their kampongs. So here the uh, community architect Yuli Kuswaro, who's leading a design session with Kampong residents. Uh, and on the on the on the board behind him, you see that they were really debating things like uh, like like the the economic costs of uh, new kinds of housing and the design, the, the spatial on the right side here, the, the numbers of people, the spatial configurations, the different kinds of living arrangements that they might be able to get from their own vision of, of, of urban design in order to, uh, to respond to the floods. And as Sandiawan Sumardi, who is an activist with this group called Chiliwong Merdeka said, you know, this kind of design process actually empowered them in the view of the city, in the eyes of the politicians. So he says, quote, for years, the urban poor in Jakarta had a very negative stigma uh, that they were lazy, passive and illegal. We proved that a collective planning process with plans and mappings could be made by the community themselves in ways that were concrete. So the act of design itself, producing visions, producing maps and plans, enable 
these Kampong residents to take part in negotiations with city officials and enable them to be seen alongside a lot of other community organizing. It wasn't just the documents and the plans themselves, but the plans with a lot of community organizing established themselves as a more uh, powerful constituent and able to assert for their own rights. This, it, it, the, the both interesting and somewhat sad reality of this is that this could be done even if the designs were not finally implemented. There are very few of these kinds of alternative uh, ideas about the kampongs that have been actually built, but they established some, they, they established power, they established power in, a, in the urban development process so that they were taken more seriously. And the sad part is that, you know, that's great, but also it still uh, doesn't, it doesn't stop these kampongs from being evicted and demolished all the time. And, and uh, in fact, shortly after Sandiawan and I had this conversation, the city actually demolished part of the kampong that he and his uh, constituents live in. Uh, even though they had ostensibly this agreement to to think about a new way to to design, so I want to emphasize that you know this is not always seen as a kind of like top down network and bottom up network, uh, or top down plan and and you know like bottom bottom up organizing the grassroots bottom-up organizing can also be seen as a kind of network in the ways that the uh, the Dutch consultants and city to city networks earlier could be seen. So on the ground in Jakarta, you had community organizers working in a particular kampong networked with other organizers from the same organization here called UP, uh, UPC, UPC, the Urban Poor Consortium, working with designers and researchers, as well as advocacy groups such as Ruja that was trying to really uh, emphasize and disseminate the kinds of knowledge and the kinds of struggle that they were working on to a broad audience. And in fact, this is how I came to know their work as someone who, you know, like I grew up in Southeast Asia, but you know, I don't have that much links to Jakarta, but I was able to, uh, to, to know about the actions of the Kampong residents through a kind of global to then very local network of urban researchers and community activists who have become a lot more, uh, a lot more effective in situating very, very local struggles among a broader global audience of, of both commentators, news commentators, and researchers. Quickly, back to New York, one of the things that is notable about design here is while the big team on the one hand, on the left here, they went to great lengths to position themselves as being community engaged, taking into, into account uh, what community and neighborhood groups wanted, even to the extent of, of branding this big U project as the, the merging of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. So merging resilient infrastructure, large scale infrastructure and community interests. It worked to an extent, but immediately after the conclusion of the competition, there, there were a lot of uh, protests and conflicts about the way that the competition would be implemented. So, in, in late 2014, uh, 
community groups asserted that even though the architects and, and the, the, the managers of Rebuild by Design may have done their designs in a way that was agreed to or, or supported, the implementation plans seem to be very, uh, very unjust and prioritizing particular places first and not others that were, that were more impacted by the storm. And these kinds of contestations on the ground have only continued in now the six years since the competition's conclusion. And in fact, even earlier this year, there was a new round of, uh, of protests, of, of counter ideas by neighborhood residents who think that their, their, their vision was taken seriously at some point and basically disregarded after the competition Ended. So the, the threat for design projects for, for conditions like this is, yes, we, I think all of us need to understand that, you know, community engagement is a critical thing. It's hard to get projects done without it anyway these days, but we want projects, we, are, we want design projects to be part of and to be part of communities on the ground and to reflect their histories and their interests. And at the same time, I think we need to recognize that often we run up against things that designers have, 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 have tended not to try to take on, which is essentially politics and policy making in cities. So, we may learn to do community engagement in a certain way, but what we haven't done is, is really try to change the levers of power in cities to get things uh, built in ways that are more, that are more socially attuned or, or just if we, if we, particularly if we value the fact that some of these communities on the ground are the ones that have been most marginalized and will be impacted most by climate change. Okay, I'm, mm, I'm gonna pause there for now. And, and uh, there, uh, there are a few things that I could talk about. Uh, there's this project for the Red Hook Initiative that I worked on and could be an interesting example, but I've been talking for a long time. I would love to just take questions first, and then if there's time later, I can I can show a little bit more. So thank you. I know that's a long, long talk. So he's um, okay. Great. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for the very insightful presentation. I'm just curious about um, in Netherlands, how was the um, how was the community engagement done there? Because um, from your presentation, I've learned that they're famous for the engineering and uh, experience for decades. But um, for example, for the new concept on Green for the River is supposed to have areas for flooding. And I'm just curious, like New York and or in Jakarta, community engagement was a key to the potential success of the project. So um, if we are learning from Netherlands, are there any lessons that we have from them also on that aspect? Yeah, I think that's a really excellent question. So Nixon, right? That's an excellent question. So in, in the Netherlands, what they have, which I think we don't have, or we don't, we may not want actually, is a history of, of, of government power and acquiescence. So how do I say this? Basically an, a state and society agreement that's been 
hundreds of years in the development or at least if you talk about the more the more recent like in the last uh you know the the last 70 years or so the the emergence of like the modern dutch welfare state the agreements broached between civil society and government that the government at some level actually does know best about some things so flood protection for instance is considered you know of primary national importance so things that have to do with flood, flood protection are often managed from the very top from a, the, this uh like right water stat basically the the water management state like this a state level dutch state level organization that makes a lot of the calls and has a multiple levels of government below the state the the national government that is able to implement those kinds of uh, planning divisions and this has been, you know, in development for a very long time. And by and large, Dutch residents agree with and accept that role of the national government. It's not to say that they don't, that they, you know, they, they, they generally agree with it, but it's not to say that in specific cases, they, they don't protest. So in, in the Room for the River project, the one in Nijmegen, which is the, the most well-known version, I think they needed to relocate something like 30, 35 households in order to, to expand the, the floodplain there. And there was some protest, but they managed to do that anyway. And they do that through, you know, some fairly well established uh, rules for how to do it and how much to compensate. And you will find in the Netherlands, like you will find in the US, people who are more either conservative in nature or more libertarian who would really prefer not to prefer the government not to have that kind of power. But the 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 structure has been such that the uh, so far anyway that 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 they have managed to do more or less what they want to do so i don't want to underplay any kind of contestation or conflict uh, there's a there's a lot of emerging conflict around urban development in the cities because you know a lot of like the Dutch center cities have been home for the cities that have a, have more immigrants, uh, cities like Rotterdam, the center cities have oftentimes been uh, places where immigrant communities have landed and are not not always convinced that the city and national government has ha that they have their interests at heart. Uh, and there is ample racism in the Netherlands that, that many folks would rather not talk about. Uh, but but these, these sort of local conflicts and the, the strife has not really emerged as a huge national issue. I mean, we, we've seen some of it around like very racist cultural incidents, like there's a black peat uh, like a Dutch Christmas tradition that has been widely protested. But broadly speaking, the sense of consensus and agreement around certain things, especially flood protection, is, is quite strong. So that's, that's one thing. One corollary point to that, which I think is interesting, is that when when they when they formed the rebuild by design initiative in new york you know one of the things that hank oving who was the basically the 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 director of rebuild by design uh who was previously the spatial planning lead i think he was like the director of spatial planning and water management or something like that in the netherlands 
he envisioned rebuild by design as a kind of structure where Dutch or European designers, possibly like Dutch, Danish, and, and other Western European designers could learn more about community engagement by working around New York and with New York area, like local communities. And for, for US, US architects and designers to learn more about comprehensive planning. So his ideal world for this idealized view about rebuild by design was that there could be an exchange among the participants between you know, community engagement and, and comprehensive planning. I think in some ways that probably happened, but that explains, I think, to, to some degree why in, in the Netherlands certain things are able to be done in, in more comprehensive ways. Thank you. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah, oh, can I ahead. ask in in terms of the uh, as you were referring now with the structure of um, the involvement of the government in Netherlands, was it partly by the urgency of the situation? Because I know that they are under the sea level for already uh, quite a while. So essentially, that way of long term, like because for relocation of people from a certain parts of the city or or settlements. Um, nobody would do it except there is an urgency in terms of doing it. So essentially, what role does government play in, in cooperation with the scientific research bodies uh, who project, especially now with the global warming, who project the time frame in which those actions would have to be implemented? Because then it's, if, if that's a centralized system, then the question of timing comes in and how much, uh, and, and how are those scientific are they also those bodies are they affiliated with the with the government or they are um, part industry uh, part community how the structure i would say it's a little bit of both uh, there there's a lot of intersection between public agencies and both private private interests but also spin off spin off companies and agencies that are a mix. So, so for instance, one of the, 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 the entities that plays a pretty big role in all the stories is Deltares, which is a research institute. And Deltares was formed from, I think in 2012 or 11, I may, might have that wrong, from a number of both public agencies and private hydrological and dredging firms. And they came together to form a kind of research institute around Delta area uh, development and water management. And so research institutes like Deltares function in a variety of different ways. They have the scientific uh, research and the scientific, the, so the scientific data that underlies some of these efforts, but they also have, along with that, folks who are quite strongly tied to both the private companies that are able to work on these development proposals. So things like, if, you, if you're familiar with this other like new model of the, the sand engine, which is a way to, to redistribute sand along the coast so that that harnesses uh, coastal flows instead of tries to do it by force so 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 harnessing both the the environmental data plus the technological infrastructure knowledge and uh, the actual ability to put those projects into place and oftentimes overseen, at least partly by folks who are, who are quite tied to public agencies. So in, in many ways, like there's, it's like, I can be both somewhat critical of the, the Dutch model, especially as a model that is often unquestioningly just 
like spread around in ways that are not necessarily thought through enough in different places around the world. Uh, but in instances like this, you can see very much why uh, the, the mix of these different kinds of, of organizations and different kinds of knowledges together have been able to, to come together. Thank you. Yeah, and one of the things on related to both both your questions, you know, there's there's been a lot of 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 effort on the part of the na Dutch national government to liberalize some of their control of things like urban development and, and planning. Uh, some of this is in response to just sometimes the I think what they see as maybe like the inefficiency of having primarily a top-down model when in a time where in the Netherlands, like in other places, there's been a lot of uh, like liberalizing, liberalizing of, of urban governance. So, you know, how can we like privatize particular services more or how can we, you know, have, uh, mixed income or different methods of, of public and private urban development. So in response to that, and especially after the 2008 economic crisis, the national government has really tried to, to hand off some of, some of that control of, of planning. So because of that handoff, you also see a little bit of that shift between what had been a kind of a you know, multi-level consensus model to one where that may be a bit more like the US where people may have to compete more for, you know, the, the particular ideas that they want implemented in cities. And I think, you know, to some degree, many designers actually like that uh, because it gives them a little bit more freedom on the ground to do other things. And so I, I don't always, sense a, a disagreement on the part of the designers themselves. And in fact, you know, one of the things that I think is always so, so interesting. So MVRDV has this project in just outside Amsterdam, like a new, what is it called? Uh, a new development outside, like in Southeast of Amsterdam where they are operating almost like a, a, a bottom up entirely master plan with no, with very little uh, sort of top down master planning ideas as to what should happen. And in that project, they actually cite a more, you know, like American kind of individualist planning and design as something that is actually desirable. Hmm. So, Hi, Kim. David. Amazing uh, lecture. Thanks. Um, I buy one by one all the concepts you brought today, especially the, the ones that um, talk about the need of a transdisciplinary approach to urban design. And this idea of avoiding the top-down vision uh, of, of uh, urban design. So th this, this tries to link a bit with the fire issue of, the, of both studios. So similar to flooding examples that you brought today, we know that fire is not, a, it's not simply a physical issue, but a disaster that uh, has to do with a lot of uh, different agents. And normally in the academic discussions, all these agents are excluded from the, um, from the um, design part. So um, this, this is a question that, well, what, what would be the, the, well, we know that academia is not a professional simulation. So uh, we are exclu excluding sometimes like important actors and, um, and issues like economy or 
So what would be the way uh, for students to take into consideration all these things without um, getting nuts and thinking that nothing is possible because of the complexity yeah. of, the, of the problem? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think it's a good segue to maybe like something that's right in front of you, the problem that's in front of you right now, which is the, the fire problem. So I think you're right, David, but I think that you're right, particularly in the case of architecture academia. And like, if I might just like, I, you know, I come from an architecture background and one of the reasons why you know, I find myself in a planning department now is that I really wanted to engage more with some of the, the processes, structures that may be outside generally of what we consider to be, to be design academia. And even for designers, like we all know, right? Like we may do a, a, a kind of, design exploration, either studio project or in, in our various offices. But we 100% recognize that should we want to actually get this done, there are all kinds of structures and hurdle, like systems that may not be well accommodated by the, the, the way of thinking that we, we are trained in. So in some ways like legal precedent issues, for instance, or economic uh, viability or political constraint. So the political constraint is like, like the, the, the best project that takes into con consideration that ticks off really all the issues. Like here's the economic benefit, here's the environmental benefit, here's the social benefit, and you'll have uh, both politicians and neighbors and other people saying like, absolutely not. Like this is entirely the opposite of what we want. And, and there's no kind of, there's no design argument that necessarily pushes that forward. So I think in the, in the, in the fire situation, so I'm going to again, I think this might be, this might be, this might be helpful. So about a year or so ago, I, I was thinking precisely about this, like about this situation of fires in California. I'm not sure if you read this. I know Robin, I made Robin was in a class and I made her and others read this. So she may have had folks read, read it, but I wrote this article for the nation about a year ago in response to the 2019 last year's fire situation in California. And one of the things that I was trying to wrap my head around is that, you know, like, why, why do we feel so constrained as designers about what to do about this. One of the things I think the, the major thing that I'm sure you all are really getting into right now is that when you look at things like sea level rise or stronger storms, particularly sea level rise and you're designing for sea level rise, you can can at least look at a cent, like some models. You can look at some models for increasing flooding. You, you can look at models of uh, like stronger storm surge given you know higher higher like higher sea levels and and you know warmer seas and things like that. And and you can come up with a fairly solid design response to that. You might say something like, oh yeah, I want a hard protection uh, here. Or you might say, okay, we need to retreat or we need to you know, like live with water, which is uh, increasingly popular. When you think about fire, those kinds of design responses seem very hard to come up with. So it is not as easily predictable where and how fires will uh, will will emerge and 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 rage, you know. And you know, one of the things that 
was so was so eye-opening to me. So this is actually a map and you can find all kinds of, you know, other versions of this. This is one that's drawn by Kelly Shannon, who teaches at USC about where the fires happen, uh, which is oftentimes in these wildlife, wildland urban interface zones. I know that those are the places that will have more and more fires but we don't know how these fires will necessarily behave when they're there. There may be, you know, the most sophisticated fire modelers, but on the ground, so much of it depends on, you know, where the wind is blowing, where the dips in the, uh, the valleys and, and the, the ridges of the hillsides are. Like when I went out, you know, I, I was so, motivated to do to write about this when i went out to the site of the uh in late 2018 in, in in near malibu one of the things that really grabbed me was how unpredictable it seemed that there were like totally scorched zones coming down some hillsides and just you know literally a few feet away you saw like a totally untouched tree or a house that was left standing whereas the neighbor's house is like totally charred some of this may be you know the kinds of like private firefighters that folks like kim kardashian and others may have had Add, but really, but that's not the, the defining factor here. It's that it is so unpredictable that our design tools are not uh, geared for that. And then the other thing is that when you look at design for fire, it it oftentimes, you know, it, it comes down to uh, a few things that you can do for designing defensible space, for instance. So making sure that there's space between structures uh, so, so that you don't have, you know, very, very combustible materials or plantings really close to structures that need to be protected. So defensible spaces or hardening, so building hardening, either having non-combust, certainly like non-combustible roofing and siding, that's, that's one of the clear things, or not having, you know, taking care of ventilation so that embers are not immediately sucked into, like under the eaves of the house or under the basements. That's one of the quickest ways for these, for structures to catch fire. Like those, those are the kinds of things that we're told about, but there's, there's not that much about a more maybe like innovative response to it. Like what could a neighborhood level response to fire look like? Like if we try to translate the idea of defensible space, not only to, uh, to just the, the, the surrounding of one structure, but around communities around or around neighborhoods or even around like, uh, what what would the unit be? It might be a new notion of the, the neighborhood unit. Like how could we think about more collective uh, responses to, to designing for fires so that we're not always just trying to harden the roofs or you know keep the fences and the and the trees away. And then so that's 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 one thing. I think there's a level of design design investigation that to, to me hasn't been had yet because there's no political and economic motivation to have that discussion. People either want to, they, they say, you know, they either want to rebuild their homes or they might think that there's no way we should abandon these sites. There's, there's, there hasn't been uh, the space for discussion of alternatives. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why there hasn't been that space is that uh, we still have a kind of ideology of home ownership that is so strong uh, that any questioning of this gets such strong political pushback from both communities on the ground that may have had to deal with these fires and 
mostly all politicians who would rather not challenge people's right to, you know, have a home, uh, have a to be able to buy their own property, to have a home, and to rebuild it again and again after fires. So there, there's little political will. And when you look at places like this, is saddle the where the Saddle Ridge fire started uh, late. When was Saddle Ridge? Uh, 2009, October 2019, something like that. It started because of how we build cities and how we build neighborhoods and homes. So, and, you know, the fire started uh, under one of these the, the storage machines. That, and when you look at on the right side here, often really close to these single family home neighborhoods here, um, or here in Porter Ranch, you see places where we build that just put us under such stress to try to protect. And we build there because we think that, uh, that people have a kind of right to have their own, their own lot and their own house. And I think that kind of ideology of property and ideology of home, home ownership should be challenged more. And not to say that we just reject home ownership or private property per se, there's a time and place for that. And I'm happy to have that, that whole discussion. Um, but for architects and designers, are we willing to look at the kinds of uh, cultural ideologies that have permeated, you, you know, the, the cities, the, the societies we live in, and to at least question it and say that this is why uh, we face the kinds of things that we face. Climate change will make fires worse, but uh, the ways that we hold on to our ideals about housing and home ownership will make it more destructive, uh, more costly to do anything about, and harder to actually design for. Hitoshi, you're on mute. God, it's, I started to do this again. So thank you. Actually, you know, there are so much to talk. So, you know, the, it, about the policy, it's always kind of a, a sort of reminds me that uh, what happened after the uh, tsunami on 2011 in Japan. So the usual low did not really respond to the emergency situation well. So that either you, they had to actually construct a new law for instance, to actually permit people to remove the destroyed car on the road to the site without knowing who's actually car mm. it is. It was law usually prohibit to trash the car without the permission of the owner, for instance. So, so it paralyzed the entire sort of a, a cleaning Right, like you can't really literally that all the car is occupying entire infrastructure, and you can't really do anything. Or there's a, a law to define how the uh, damaged uh, hospital can be actually rebuilt by the finance from the government, but it says it has to be on the oh. same site. What's the point, right, to rebuild yeah. the hospital? in an area which was destroyed by water. He wants to build it somewhere high up for better good in the long run. So even this kind of a law is built for actually the normal time. I don't know what's normal, but uh, let's say when nothing is happening. Yeah. So the, the law itself is not resilient enough to respond to the different mode of our life 
right? So the different mode meaning this and then something might happen once in a 20 years or 100 years. So there's a different kind of a mode that you might need to respond and uh, also the law needs to respond and it's really difficult. And, and uh, also when designer, I mean, I started this organization called Arcade. You know, it's a collaborative of 200 architects in Japan to help the reconstruction of the area. And uh, it was interesting to actually sort of join as a group as for the bottom up sort of approach for the reconstruction because somebody was assigned from government to take care of this from top down. So there's a naturally some kind of a conflict, right? Mm. And uh, sometimes actually the, the way they do is incredibly sort of a, a brutal, right? When they actually want to relocate the uh, community to high up, they chop the mountain basically. Uh, so instead of laying it out on a slope, and then there's a certain kind of code issue and so on. So um, I, I am kind of curious, it's, it was so hard for these kind of a, a group to up sort of a, to work with the local government to modify their code or to modify certain kind of bureaucratic mechanism to actually somehow reflect the sort of a, a, a thinking or the vision generated by the bottom-up movement. So mm. uh, sometimes actually it's successful, sometimes just horribly. So I'm just curious uh, if there's any example that some a good example that we should look at so that this kind of a new proposal by the designer and uh, also the some kind of a governmental effort to accommodate this kind of a, a situation by changing or modifying code or you know the system you know is there any good example of such a collaboration we can look at yeah i think that that's a really that's it i mean that's an excellent question and like so but that that underlies so much of this right and often you know some of the laws that you're talking about were made to protect people to protect people, to make sure that they that they weren't displaced or they didn't lose their property and things like that. So, th in some ways, there could have been like some good intention behind the making of that law. Uh, and like you made me think about one thing. Oh, so like recently we had a debate in the California legislature about about insurance, right? So many of the insurance companies were about to pull or not reissue their home insurance for people who, who live in these uh, highly threatened like wildlife urban interface areas. And, and they couldn't do it. Like the, the, the insurers were like, there's no, there's no reason to keep on, you know, paying people to rebuild. The same thing in the floodplains, the, the FEMA floodplains, we have a national, like we have national legislation that requires that we reissue the flood insurance for for places that will flood again. And this just this last year, there was so much pushback um, from people, like people, like communities on the ground and politicians, that the insurers had to who had to walk that back. So they they could not. Uh, make this decision even though even though when we think about it we're like it's it does seem sort of foolish to keep ensuring things that will burn again in terms of you know like good examples there should be some <laughs> there should be some good examples you know there are but, small yeah there are small examples that work or that seem to be going better. So, you know, I sort of kept in the, the news about or kept, kept in touch with what's going on in Jakarta. 
And in a few weeks ago, I actually, I, I tuned into this panel where people who live, the Kampong residents who live in this Kampong called Kampong Aquarium, which was also partly demolished, uh, they actually organized to have an agreement with the local government to not to to do something different and i haven't looked at this in the flashlight this was after the bulk of my research but i heard from some of the people who are on the ground there a couple of weeks ago and they actually said that they could see some progress here mm -hmm. where the city government is acknowledging that uh that 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 the residents on the ground have a good claim to continue to be there, hmm. but that they need help to come up with a new kind of housing structure that that is not the, the same, not that doesn't involve the same kinds of like new government uh, buildings that are oftentimes like far outside the center of the city, but they're working together to, to try to find, to, to build some new housing that mm. is both top down so it's government funded and uh, coordinated but with these organizers and community activists on the ground so that version it's been you know one might say it it relied on a lot of conflict and 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 protests from the past but and it's only you know is probably yeah, I don't know three hundred households, so it's not mm -hmm. huge, but but the the political pressure worked in that sense to as far as as far as we can gauge right now. Um, there's also another example mm -hmm. of in Louisiana. This is like uh, it's been in the news because it's like there this community is considered like the first climate refugees in the uh, the lower lower US so not in Alaska uh, so what's this called oh the Ile de Ile de Jean Charles so Ile yeah. French for island so this this is a community where they knew that they would have to be displaced or they knew that they would not be able to stay there long term and there's some conflicting stories about this i've read some versions where the community members actually work with the state to relocate into a new town or a new center that actually accommodates what the previous residents wanted by and large like they knew that they had to move they knew that they had to re resettle somewhere uh but they did it in cooperation i've also heard some other folks who are a little bit closer on the ground that yeah it's not it's not great it's 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 okay so there's there's some different narratives about what happened but it was it has been held up as an example where where we did do that where the state and communities work together to do what needed to be done in in the face of you know climate change. In for fires, I don't is see, a, yeah. uh, is a rebuilt by design is a successful example or how things are going with that project. I think rebuilt by design is a successful is it example. Or? Yeah, no. So it I think it's a successful. Uh -huh. I think there were aspects of the idea that that were quite successful. I think it put into um, it put into discussion among some city government groups and some government like federal government agencies that that design and climate change was a, a really critical thing. Which before you know, 2012, yeah, you 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 would not be able to find that example. And I think it also provided an interesting example of how to combine, uh, like nonprofit funding with federal funding in a quite interesting way. Right. Right. 
And I think that shouldn't be discounted. I think that that actually push forward our ideas about what's possible between, uh, you know, between like a what a foundation can support and what uh, what the federal government already has resources for. But the you know the individual projects haven't. You, I don't think we can consider any of them a success yet because they're still at best just breaking ground now. Right. So like the Big U project has been basically fragmented a few times over and they're really trying to build this thing before I think 2022, which is when the funding allocation expires. So they're, they're going all out to build this. And if they do, what seems like is that it will be an okay version of it. Uh -huh. Like something that a lot of people don't agree with, the parks people totally disagree with the, you know, people who like, um, who are like parks fans of, in the Lower East Side totally don't agree with it because it uproots and changes a lot of current like natural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of community groups don't like it because it will take away their open space for like three years or something. Um, and some resilience people don't like it because it will possibly protect one part of lower Manhattan from a sandy level storm, but that's it. Like there's no, like so much of the ambitions from before have just been, have, have not been accommodated. I mean, there are other, I think, interesting examples like the, the one by Scape. I'm sure you've all seen the living breakwater project by the, by the landscape architecture firm Scape. And I think that one, there are some aspects of success because I think what Scape has managed to do is to just assert that community education is part of these long-term landscape projects. So even though a full build out of something like that may take, you know, like a decade or, 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 or more, uh, the, the bringing together of people, people in the neighborhoods around what they consider to be like important, you know, providing like uh, education around why we have to do this, or even in the interim, having community events around the, the, the implementation of the plan itself. I think that's fairly successful. I think when we think about urban landscape projects that will take 20 years to fully build, having people alongside, even in the very beginning part, I think is a really, uh, it's a key thing, and I think they've been able to do it in in a in a good way. I see. It's uh, you know, there's a couple of kind of uh, things that uh, you reminded me. After the uh, this 2011, I drove around the area completely dis destroyed. Right, maybe a year after, and a couple of years later. And then you see that the kind of uh, area, the whole house was taken by waves, right? So that's like a, <laughs> you must not live area technically. And it is now defined to be the area that no residential sort of a, a construction is allowed. But then at the same time, you see, you know, you see only the foundation left and then uh, some kind of uh, signage posted by the family saying, let us come back here, right? So conceptually, you know, it is very important to let the people be out, but uh, also the problem is that those people basically were removed from the community and there are so much sort of things that they attach to their land. And uh, one of the biggest problem also of this situation was that actually some area uh, was a really old area 
So there is no record、mm. that you can identify the land that you used to own. So the, the problem was nobody r e m e m b e r how big your land was and so on.、Mm. So it's really difficult to actually initiate the,、uh, a move, also. And、uh, the, the so much things related to the disaster can be approached from so many different ways. For instance, You know, that keeping such a record or something, and then also how you actually help to move the community to proper way so that people d o e s n t feel sort of your, you being completely sort of、uh, taken apart by your life, you know, by the government and so on. And,、uh, you know, it's, 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 I, I think what's really important here. Here is that we need to really look at the、uh, disaster as really complicated phenomena rather than just a scary, brutal, natural sort of a、uh, phenomenon. And、uh, also find a way to approach to it from so many different angles. So I don't know if you know this one happy example of how community is responding to the disaster. I think it's in the southern France, and I forgot the name of this medieval town, a very small village by the uh, uh, river. And they get flooded almost every other year. And uh, like uh, the flood goes up to the ground level completely. So, what's going on is that the, they do festival <laughs> and、uh, they remove the ground floor so that, that they can let the water go. They kind of gave up, but they, instead they do some kind of a mud festival or whatever.、Mm. And then they keep the, the measurement like where this is water this year, that year, that year. So it's kind of, they turn it into, they turn the disaster into seasonal event. And、uh, I don't think we can do that with the fire, but there's a certain way. That we can kind of take this as a also interesting sort of a positive lesson to deal with the, some kind of a disaster.、Uh, so, I, I, I think maybe one, I mean, I think somehow you have to really see those d i s a s t e r is a part of your life. If you are, it's not something that never happened, it will happen. So, how you actually, your life and the structure. Around you, environment around you can actually be ready to somehow respond to it or your way of living. And I don't know yet, I mean, what to do with the fire, but、uh, somewhere there, there's something interesting. Yeah. And I think that notion that, that the disaster is not,、uh, it cannot be considered an exceptional and An unprecedented thing all the time, right? Like, if, if there's anything this year has taught us, is that unexpected things just need to be part of how we, we live. Like, that we cannot, yeah, and, and we, we, we do have to find ways to, to、uh, not to normalize disasters, but to understand that they are happening. And, you、yeah. know, what? So, just one another example. You talked about in, in, in Japan the problems, in, especially in the older neighborhoods, with, with replotting or understanding where the previous plots were. So, there is an example in Banda Aceh in Sumatra, Indonesia. So, this was like the ground zero, really, of the 2004. Uh, Asian Ocean, no, was the Indian Ocean tsunami? So, on the north tip of Sumatra Island, so whole parts of the city completely it's like it's like in 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 uh like Tohoku, like it basically leveled.、Mm -hmm. And there, there's one example of. A neighborhood, a community that actually came together and replatted, not based on like some other thing, but cooperatively said that 
what's done is done. We lost like 30% of our residents literally just died overnight. We need to do things in a new way. So they cooperatively just allocated new plots for each of the households. Mm. Wow. That's a really difficult thing to do, actually. Yeah, no, it's... Yeah. <laughs> It's 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 so it's so it's painful. It's yeah, like you it have these memories that you recognize are are no longer part of your life. Right. Uh, so I I think I'm sure no you guys don't have anything to ask questions. I mean I can just keep going with her, but uh, you know it's not our. I mean Bella. I mean you are actually. They sent me email talking about some kind of attitude towards how to handle the uh, disaster. I think you know that you mentioned that the disaster is something uh, sort of a, there's a simulation and there's a kind of a reality of the disaster and there's a huge sort of a, a, a gap between them. So that's really difficult to predict and then how you deal with that unpredictability of the disaster and uh yeah wanna... well we um oh sounds very impressive i mean as a voice I, is it echoey yeah this is nice this is better now perfect. yeah um so yeah we me and amy were interested in researching or kind of focusing for the quarter on this gap essentially between um, between uh, what is predicted and then what actually happens and and how you have you know we know a certain amount of things and that's what we come up with via these you know simulators and predictions but the reality is that something else usually occurs at the same time the reality is that we have to prepare for it somehow or to the best of our ability because it if we just say we can't, you know, prepare and so therefore we shouldn't at all is obviously not going to work. But, and so I guess I thought particularly what you said on that accord of just how it's actually like, there's such a gap always, um, I think is something that one isn't necessarily thought about from, you know, just a daily standpoint, but also I think that we've been understanding that to be something that's very real, but then how do you um physically and infrastructurally actually designed for that because it feels like there's just infinite amounts of possibilities that i guess could occur i i thought the um the pool slash like basketball court was a really interesting example of kind of this like part of the city that assists and can be a way that you change something that you wouldn't normally change such as like mm. why wouldn't you take advantage of a mm. pool or a basketball court if you can and so to design in ways like that but if to think about like other other aspects that you might not be able to change so easily or adjust so easily such as housing how do you like start to approach those things from like a I guess really physical or infrastructural standpoint <clears throat> Yeah, I think you're right. You're talking about this, the uncertainty, right? The necessity to plan and design for uncertainty on so many levels. And, you know, I, you know, it reminds me of times and places where we actually know that we have to design for uncertainty. So I believe all of you, well, besides David, like you're all in the LA region right now, like we're constantly under threat of a major earthquake. We know that. And physically, you know, our new buildings are at least geared for some level of that. So especially like larger buildings. So we know that we have to prepare for things that are super, are, you know, that, that I don't know, can we consider a big earthquake unlikely? Something's going to happen at some point, but how it affects the particular places and buildings is completely unknown, right? Depending on where and how that happens. So we do, we do take into account that 
in our design practices, in our zoning codes and things like that. Uh, we, we do that on a social level too. We don't know when we'll have to deal with, you know, like uh, three days or a week of having no power, but hopefully we have like a couple of big jugs of water somewhere. So that, that, that preparation is already ingrained sometimes for us. I think many people would say that we're not adequately prepared for earthquakes. I, I think that's probably true. Um, but on an institutional built environment level, I think we're better now than we've been in the past. I think um, if you look at uh, for, for hurricanes, I'm not an expert on these cases, but a friend of mine who studies like the difference between Florida and elsewhere, like Florida has actually, because they face major hurricanes so often, they're actually quite good at both requiring a certain amount of physical protection for, for you know, like new buildings. And they're, they're reasonably good at the population uh, doing what is needed when they face one. So people are like, okay, hurricane coming, let's like board the windows, let's make sure we have water, make sure we have food, make sure that we know how to evacuate if we have to. So that kind of thing is actually developed over time. In Florida, it's partly in response to repeated hurricanes, but other places have had repeated hurricanes, but they have not institutionalized that response to uncertainty. Um, so, so I think these kinds of things should be more part of the design process in the way that we know when we design uh, a building now in 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 a hurricane prone place or an earthquake prone prone place, we have building technology responses. I think we have to think at the same time about the the social responses that can be part of how we design. So how do we help people do the things that we we want them to do? in preparation for some of these disasters. And maybe like not always think that like the disaster is like a building code issue that we just accommodate, but that perhaps we are responsible for how people behave uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, the term resilience is coming because you have to be resilient against the, uh, this unpredictable, so this gap between the sort of what is expected and what's really happening, right? So that that's where the term resilient coming. So, uh, yeah. So your keyword is set, right, Bella? Um, I have a thought that. I would like help flushing out. <laughs> I know that uh, my group, can you guys hear me well? Okay. I know that my group, we're really interested um, in the like community planning aspect of our research. Um, mainly we're looking at the Woolsey fire. Um, but uh, what we've kind of noticed through our research is that uh, this particular case, uh, like what the definition of community is um, specifically within this area um, is a little bit um, difficult to tackle um, in a sense that like maybe there isn't as much community as there could be uh, within this uh, kind of residential landscape. Um, and so kind of seeing how you can be proactive, adaptive, and responsive, and how uh, an area that actually might not want community in the typical way that we think about community, um, how that kind of plays into uh, this, mm. these different phases. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think the different versions of community might be around the Woolsey Fire area? Like, why, why is there lack of clarity 
Um, I don't know if anybody wants to help me in my group, but um, I think that, again, maybe this is like a, just a general assumption based on research that we've we've had, but um, I think it's maybe the lack of urgency in 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 the disaster. So really uh, individuals that live in their like flight paradise might not really be living there to uh, interact with others. Um, and so, you know, kind of dealing with that in preparing for such disasters as, mm -hmm. as well as responses and maybe not relying on you know, the government or insurances as much. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, I think in, in that case, and like your teammates can pipe in to, I imagine some of what you're, you're talking about is that there's so many different kinds of people and points of view mm -hmm. around Malibu, Calab Calabasas and Topanga or however, you know, like these different places um, around a fairly large fire zone, yeah. what they might think. And yeah, I, that, I think that's a fair point. And I would say this, that community should never be ex assumed anyway. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a, I was just talking to this with my, my class the other day. There's a really interesting chapter by a political theorist, Iris Marion Young, who really questions the notion of over stipulating the community as the, the unit of what we might consider to be like the, like the best unit for us to plan around if we are more concerned about uh, bigger, like bigger issues. So, and she has a lot of reasons why, but she, she puts her finger on why I think you, you see the uncertainty or the lack of clarity or the, or the conflict in trying to call a group of people in a place community. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the work that I do, so these, these people in places that I've been talking about, like, I think it's pretty clear to me that community comes from a shared position and a shared um, a shared sense of experience and struggle. So like the com community members in Red Hook are largely people who live in the Red Hook houses, which is a NYCHA public housing project. And they see, they, they see the same things that's going on, going on. So the gentrification, or the lack of maintenance in the Red Hook houses, or you know, like um, you know, the challenges of keeping their park space open. They have those shared positions and points of view and, and challenges. And so for them, I think when they point to community, like uh, Jill Eisenhart, who's the director of the Red Hook Initiative, who works with uh, folks around Red Hook, she'll point out, yeah, all of them have these, this experience of not having a grocery store uh, with fresh fruit unless, you know, un until Fairway came and Fairway was clearly not uh, meant for them. It was not priced for them. It was priced for other people. So that kind of sense of community was very strong. I think that it's a helpful way to consider community, but then when you're talking about designing for groups that are bigger than that one community, I think that's when we have to acknowledge that, you know, there could be multiple communities with very contested ideas of what they want. So, and in Malibu, I might think, you know, there, there are probably some people who have been there for 30 years. They're not particularly wealthy. They're just like, I just want to be here. I love this place. Yeah, my house keeps burning down, but like, I, I don't ask for much, but I would like to stay here and be able to rebuild. And there could be other folks who are like super wealthy who possibly have been there for less time. I don't know. I'm idealizing my own view of who these folks are, mm -hmm. but they may have a completely different view of things. And, and, and I think as designers, we, I don't think it's our job necessarily to make everyone happy all the time, but we can at least understand that we may be 
trying to accommodate uh, some, some different and sometimes irreconcilable desires. That's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. So hypothetically, let's say somebody proposes this kind of a, I don't know, they like a fire scared people community or something, and then ask, you know, certain area of the people who, who in the wild urban interface to kind of to get together and then to share certain kind of a, I don't know what it is, like a group insurance or some way to actually take care of the trees around or set up certain kind of protocols for evacuation mm -hmm. and so on. Do you think this kind of a community can be proposed and then be real in the United States context? In Japan, I think it could be actually. So yeah. because that, yeah, that will lead the idea that how big this community should be and uh, where, how you actually mm. strategically should organize it or is there any common sort of a infrastructure that they can think of? And, you know, that, that, that kind of opens up the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. And so I, I agree. It's, I, you know, from what little I know about Japan, I think it would be possible in Japan. Uh, I think the, the precedent for that kind of co like collaboration, cooperation is maybe a little bit more present. I know that in, in the Netherlands, that is what they, they keep pointing to around the, you know, the water boards, the earliest versions of which were in like the 1200s, 1250, 800 years ago, when, when, when people came together to afford to, you know, build one windmill to pump out the water. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's inherently shared, right? Like you can only do it if you come together. And right. I think we see some versions of that in like the community land trust movement in the US. Right. right. Um, and this has been a long time housing advocacy struggle, right? So people who have tried for decades now to try to break the normal workings of housing development saying that, okay, like, look, we have this opportunity if we have some help. Like in Boston, I think the, the uh, community land trust that, that, that is most, I think most famous is of, often used as an example, uh, is one where the, it was community led, but they actually had to involve the city. They, they um, it's called Dudley Street, Dudley Street neighborhood, mm -hmm. Dudley Street Community Land Trust, possibly. They, they came together and said, look at all these abandoned houses, the, the, the open lots. We need to do something together to protect this neighborhood or we're just going to lose it. And they convinced the city to help them by mm -hmm. giving them or paying for or otherwise uh, like pulling together the the lots and the finances to to develop something like this so in that case i think the the urgency of something actually helped them help them right. recognize that as a community if we don't come together we're not going to be able to survive right so i think that that example that's the the precedent can be built on Right. And uh, also U.S., even there are lots of people so active in your know, kids' school activities and so on. So it's a little different from the kind of a traditional kind of community. But uh, still, I see that kind of uh, passion sometimes among the American people. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think there are good opportunities. And yeah, and I think that like, like designers like us should be part of like, can we provide the vision for why people should want this? Like, yeah. because I think often like we don't, we can't see why it would be better to do things differently. Right. So that kind of respond to also 
this kind of a resilient, you know, aspect of this kind of an initiative so that you might actually create some flex sort of a, a resiliency against those unpredictable nature of the disaster through so but anyway that's the uh yeah so you might have to just create the one yeah. but uh, in order to understand the uh, fire, I, I get it. It's really difficult to keep track on those kind of information, right? So, and you don't have uh, any sort of uh, a community around the school here, or you don't have uh, any sort of a small town sort of a community. I think you must know, but maybe it's really difficult to get the information of those probably after there's, that. There's actually, um, so tomorrow at the um, MSAUD um, um, class studio, we're going to have uh, Greg uh, Kochanowski, which uh, works at uh, oh. Rios Clemente Hale. And he's, I, I think he suffered the uh, Woolsey fire uh, with the loss of his house. Uh, and he's actually involved in the in a program called Fire Adapt Adaptive Communities in the area of the Bullsey Fire. So um, if if well, I was saying but in private to Jen that if you guys are interested in in the Bullsey case study, you should uh, came. But yeah, I I think it's like we we. I agree with what Kian was saying that there are times that we tend to assume that everyone has the same feeling about what community means, while actually it's like a concept in dispute and like some people doesn't really want to be involved in things, but it's a but it, but they are also part of the community, you know. So um, yeah, like. Well, I, I recommend everyone to join because I think it's going to be an interesting uh, point of, of view. But there are communities of mm. uh, fire resiliency. Yeah, that would be interesting. So I, I know Greg and he just wrote a book about this, right? Didn't he just... So that would be interesting for, for you all to listen in for that. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> the battery for this one is out. Right? <laughs> so, um, maybe that was a good conclusion, actually. And, uh, you know, uh, please, David, uh, don't forget to record his lecture. Okay. So that it's available for everybody. And, uh, I mean, unless there's any other question, this will be probably the time to say goodbye to Kian. Is there anybody wants to continue the conversation? Okay. So thank you very much, Kian, again. And uh, yeah, it was great. So we can, I will see you next week, right? My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks all. Good. Appreciated hearing your comments and questions too. Thanks. I don't know Thank how to do that myself. I use my okay. hand. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank Have you. a good weekend. Bye. So hold on, guys. Hold on, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So um, probably we should end today's class unless anybody wants to talk. And next week, we kind of now jump into the conversation about the research you're doing and uh, please be ready to talk about it. I think we can spend hour to each group to discuss about it. Okay. Any questions or anybody who wants to talk with me today? You guys are so quiet and modest. So when you say that we can spend an hour talking about each about each one is that like breakout rooms or are we doing it together together but i will spend one hour for one group another 
I mean, three hours, right? Okay, great. So, I mean, obviously, you know, I tend to go over much longer, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to learn what you've been up to. And uh, also, you know, I think we actually spent a lot of energy to organize this lecture series. So uh, it would be nice if you could also join tomorrow. I mean, you started to realize that uh, we are tackling these things from various angles and, you know, sometimes English isn't so good, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, they are all really professionals and uh, experts on the each area. So, okay. So then thank you very much. And I will see you, oh yeah, tomorrow morning. Thank you.